Hi, let's talk about cataract surgery in pathological myopia. Now, this is a 65-year-old lady who has been wearing thick glasses for all of her life and now she has come for cataract surgery. She has this grade 3 nucleus sclerosis in the dilated fundus examination. These are the fundus pictures. Although we can see areas of choroidal atrophy, the foveal area seems to be reasonably alright and the OCT also has been done. And of course, we need to give guarded progeal prognosis and examine the retina for any predetachment lesions. And thankfully, she did not have any. And she needs to be counseled that the risk of retinal attachment is going to be high. And she requires a periodic and frequent follow up in the immediate and late post operative period as well. Now, these are the biometry readings and the axial length is very high. It's around 33 millimeters and the IL calculation Barrett's has come to around minus 2. So, I'm going to use the Alcon Expand series minus 2 diopter lens for this patient. As we all know, at this power, we have got very limited options and uh, I want to choose a lens which has the least uh, potential for inducing PCO. Of course, we don't have the most ideal lens, but this is one of the better options which we have. Before performing surgery, these are some of the points which I will be mindful of. Intraoperatively, some of the challenges which I'm going to face is uh, to get the rexis right because these eyes are huge. The pupil will be extremely well dilated and sometimes we may err on a slightly bigger rexis or an eccentric rexis and we want the rexis to overlap the lens 360 degrees so this ensures that the lens sticks onto the position and we can achieve better centration. The first priority is to get the rexis right. Second, I would be concerned about the sudden deepening of the chamber which can happen because of the iris retropulsion syndrome and this is something which I need to take care of and I don't want to work in extremely deep uh, chamber situation. So I'd be trying to operate with the slightly lower infusion pressure by reducing the bottle height and also if required I'll be lifting up the iris when the infusion starts off just to prevent the reverse pupillary block and the iris retropulsion syndrome. This happens because of the low scleral rigidity which we expect in these pathological myopic eyes because of the fluctuations in the chamber which are more compared to a regular patient there is going to be some stretch on the ciliary body and that's the reason why the patient will be much more sensitive to pain compared to the average axial length patient. So that's also my concern to have an adequate intracameral anesthesia. Of course, in these long guys, I don't want to use any needle peripheral bar anesthesia. So I'm going to perform the surgery into topical anesthesia supplemented with the intracameral anesthesia. Maybe I would like to use it a couple of more times inside the eye as the surgery is being performed. The pupil has come down a little bit in size as the patient was waiting for its turn and nevertheless we can use intracameral dilating agents to ensure that the pupil dilates well. The pupil is now very well dilated. I prefer to stay in the capsule in such eyes although the red glow is excellent. The chamber is then pressurized with OVD. Time to create the main incision. 2.8 mm clear corneal incision is being performed in the superior quadrant as the patient was having pre-existing with the rural astigmatism. So for me, the major step in this surgery is the rexis. So getting a well-centered and appropriately sized rexis is extremely critical. To just help me out, I'm going to use this corneal marker, which is going to guide me in having a 5 mm rexis. Although because of the extremely deep chamber, the parallax effect, it may not be very accurate, but still it's going to give me a rough guide rather than relying on this extremely well dilated uh, pupillary margin. I see few radial folds in the capsule as the capsule is being punctured. The flap is raised and the capsule is begun tearing. I'm trying to stick on to the template which is there on the cornea to guide me to center the rexus well. The capsule is tearing well enough so I don't find there is any zonular laxity. I'm going to rally around the template on the cornea and uh, I think I've got an appropriately sized rexus but maybe a wee bit eccentric. Let's see how things turn out. I'm going to perform gentle hydrodissection and you can see this gentle wave which is confirming the cortical cleaving hydrodissection. The nucleus is pushed down at the opposite pole to let the fluid escape out of the capsule bag. This ensures that the capsule bag is decompressed. 
The nucleus is rotated gently using a lens hook, just confirming that the corticocapsular adhesions are well and truly broken. At this moment, I am entering in the epinucleus mode and uh, the bottle height is kept around 55 centimeters. And now I am going to switch to the chop mode. And in all these steps, I'm going to keep the bottle at 55 centimeters. In the chop mode, the vacuum is around 400 and the flow rate is 30. This is slightly lesser than what I typically use. The power mode is going to be longitudinal energy in burst mode. The nucleus is reasonably dense. It's around grade 3. So it's easy to hold it and chop it. It's not going to be much of an issue. The first chop is got. Then the second chop is done. And so we've got three fragments from the first heminucleus. It's quite easy to crack the nucleus if the nucleus is of ideal density, as it is in this case. The nucleus is rotated and the second heminucleus is being divided in a similar fashion using the vertical chop technique. Uh, the settings are now changed to the quadrant removal mode and uh, we're back to the torsional energy mode here with the IP mode on. The flow rate is around 30 and the vacuum is again 400. The only thing which I change is the power modality and the power is kept around 50% because the nucleus is slightly denser. Each of these fragments are pulled out of the bag and then emulsified. The one striking feature which I have noticed is the lack of low steel rigidity. And because the patient is slightly elderly, she's around 65-70, maybe the scleral coat is quite thick and so this definitely the scleral rigidity is not an issue. I don't see the sudden deepening of the chamber, the chamber is maintained well and I don't have to lift up the iris whenever I'm introducing the phaco probe or the negation. This is primarily because of the good scleral rigidity this patient has having in spite of being eye with pathological myopia. So the last uh, fragment is emulsified and uh, uh, that's it, the nucleus emulsification part is done and over. Time to remove the cortex. As is customary, I'm trying to blow in the posterior capsule with the BSS just to clean it up a little bit. At this point, I just remind myself that I need to be mindful and the case is not completed because these methodological myops are at risk of you know, having a high incidence of PC tears and it can happen even during cortex aspiration. So I need to be a little bit careful the bag is inflated with OVD as I complete the cortex aspiration. So, so far so good. Now before implanting the intraocular lens, I am particular that I want to introduce a CTR into the bag and the CTR which I am going to introduce is the bigger one that is 12 to 14 model. The usual CTRs which we use for average uh, axial length eyes is the 11 and 13 and the one which I am using is 12 and 14. What is the idea of using a CTR in this thing? So I believe that whenever the ring is there inside the bag, uh, the bag is taut and the posterior capsule is slightly pushed forward and this ensures that it sticks on to the optic of the lens and this ensures a better long-term centration of these hydrophobic lenses. So that's my idea of using these CTRs. This is my usual way of introducing CTR. I prefer to use this by manual way and uh, the CTR is now nicely into the for nicest of the capsular bag. So this is the uh, multi-piece lens of the expand series which I'm going to implant into the eye. It looks like a typical multi-piece lens, nothing special. The lens is dialed into the capsular bag. OVD both in front and behind the lens is aspirated out. I'm just checking the centration of the lens and the rexus size. The rexus size seems to be okay, but uh, there's a mild eccentricity to it. But nevertheless, it should work well. The side board and the main incisions are hydrated. That's it, the case is done. These are the post-operative pictures and this is the first day vision. And she had a 618 vision the first day unaided. Obviously, she was extremely thrilled that she has not experienced such vision in her life. And it's important to counsel the patient that periodic examination of the retina is mandatory. She's going to have a, a dilated peripheral retinal evaluation 15 days from now. And hopefully, she should be doing fine. To summarize, pathological myopia can be a challenging case. But if we plan it well enough, 
and take adequate precautions uh, things work out pretty well so that was it thank you for watching and hope you found this helpful